Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, when I was a kid, I remember growing up, and on Friday nights, I'd always race downstairs and watch the Dukes of Hazard. I'm not sure my mom ever really cared for the show, but she chose her battles carefully, and this wasn't one that she chose to fight. Well, if you've never watched it, if you're too young or too old, the story centered around Bo and Luke Duke, and they lived in Hazard County, Georgia. And as the opening song would say, they were just two good old boys who never meant any harm. And yet somehow, Bo and Luke Duke were always in trouble with the law. And I remember the crux of the whole show, almost every episode, you would have the sheriff, Roscoe P. Coltrane, chasing after Bo and Luke Duke. And the two boys would get in the General Lee, which was this orange-colored Dodge Charger, and they would be chased by the sheriff. And the goal was always to make it to the county line. If the two Duke boys could get to the county line, they'd be safe. And so almost every episode, the chase was on. Roscoe hot on their trail, the boys aiming for the Hazard County line, and almost without fail, the two boys would race across it as Roscoe would come to a screeching halt, get out to watch the boys race off, and then throw his sheriff's hat in the dirt in disgust. Well, I remember that, and I bring it up this morning, because that image plays a part in what we think of when we think of a kingdom. You see, most of us, when we think of a kingdom, we think of an area with a very well-defined border. Maybe when you hear the word kingdom, you think of the United Kingdom, a country with a monarch with very clearly marked and well-defined borders. And if you happen not to like the kingdom you're in, like Hazard County, you simply cross the border. We've heard of that in the United States recently. Over the last year, if you've listened to the news, there have been a number of companies and even a number of very rich individuals who don't like the tax structure in the United States. And so they've simply moved across the border. They've picked up their assets, they've picked up their companies, and they've moved someplace that's more beneficial to their financial structure. Well, unfortunately, that image of a kingdom with a very well-defined border is what we have in mind when we hear our gospel reading for today. Our gospel reading, it comes from the first chapter of Mark. And it begins in verse 14. And St. Mark tells us, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Believe, repent and believe the gospel. Well, there was that word again. Kingdom. The kingdom of God is at hand. And like any kingdom, we tend to think of God's kingdom as having very well-defined borders. Perhaps we even bring those images into mind when we pray the Lord's Prayer. When we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. All those thoughts and images converge. And maybe we think of God's kingdom, if you go back 2,000 years as we read scripture, and we think of Israel as God's kingdom, a nation developed by God, established by God, with very well-defined borders. It doesn't matter whether you were thinking of King David or King Solomon or even King Herod at the time of Jesus. It was God's kingdom, and it had well-defined borders. 
Maybe if you move forward in history a little bit, God's kingdom was Western Europe, wherever the reach of the Roman Catholic Church could extend. After all, it was the Roman Catholic Church that held most of civilization together as the Roman Empire fell. And so God's kingdom was Western Europe. Today we tend to think of God's kingdom wherever we find a church or a chapel. After all, this is where God's word is preached, where his sacraments are rightly administered. This is where we come to hear about God. This is his kingdom. And yet, as soon as we leave the parking lot, as soon as we leave that well-defined border, we tend to think we're in another kingdom, another world, a secular world, that runs by different rules. But the truth is, when Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand, That's not what he meant at all. You see, Jesus wasn't talking about any physical kingdom. But instead, he was talking about the last day. The day when God would physically come to visit his people and to bring judgment and salvation. The prophet Isaiah, in chapter 24, in this next quote, he declares, Behold, the Lord will empty the earth And make it desolate. And he will twist its surface and scatter its inhabitants. On that day, the Lord will punish the host of heaven in heaven. And the kings of the earth on the earth. Isaiah is proclaiming the sovereignty of God over all of creation. There is no place you can go to escape God's kingdom. There is no place in heaven, no place on earth. God created it. He will judge it. And the prophet Amos, he continues that thought of judgment in chapter 5 of his book. In the next quote, Amos writes, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. It is darkness and not light, as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. That is what happens when the kingdom of God comes. There is no escaping it. There is no outrunning it. There is no crossing a border in order to find safety and asylum. Because the whole of the earth is the Lord's. He made it. He will judge it. And so in the first chapter of Mark, When Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand, he is declaring the reign and rule of God that has finally come. Jesus is ushering in the last days as God himself. Jesus, as the very son of God, the holy one of Israel, has come down to his creation. Sin will be punished. Justice will finally reign. But it's all not doom and gloom either. You see, the Old Testament, it speaks of two sides of God's visitation. Not only will God bring judgment, but he will also bring salvation. Listen again to the prophecies of Isaiah, this time from chapter 35. And Isaiah writes, Say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. God will come with judgment. Make no mistake about that. But he will also come with salvation, with grace, and mercy and forgiveness for all of his people. And once more, listen again, this time from the prophet Zechariah. In chapter 13, Zechariah writes, On that day there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. 
There will be a fountain that washes away every stain, every sin, every black mark. God will come with judgment, but he will also come with forgiveness, with life and salvation. And that is the salvation that Jesus had in mind when he declares, repent and believe the gospel. You see, Jesus, as God himself, he is ushering in the last days. But he only gives us a foretaste, a small appetizer of what will finally come. You see, Jesus, he certainly brings salvation and healing for the broken creation. As he walked throughout Judea, he heals the blind man. And yet not every blind man sees again. Jesus certainly goes and with grace he heals the lepers. But not every leper was cleaned from sickness and disease. Jesus certainly raised the dead to life again. And he proved without doubt that as the very son of God he has authority over life and death. And yet not everyone who had died was brought back to life. You see, Jesus, he is ushering in the last days. But there is still time. There's time to repent. There's time to believe the good news of salvation. There's time for you and me. And there is also time for us to go out and to repeat the call of Jesus and to spread the good news of the gospel. You see, the truth is, there will be a final day of judgment. There will be a day when people won't have the time to repent. And we are getting closer to that day all the time. Jesus tells us that we will know when the end is near. There will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be famines and earthquakes. There will be false prophets. And you and I, we will be hated solely for the name of Jesus Christ. All of those promised signs, they are happening right now all around us. The last day is coming, and it is coming soon. But for now, there is a little more time. There is time for us to repeat the call of Jesus. Repent and believe the gospel. There is time for us to spread that news both far and wide, to shout it from the mountaintops, and to let every living and breathing soul know the name of Jesus Christ. God the Father has graciously given us this time so that more and more people may come to know the salvation that is theirs in Jesus. We don't know exactly when the end will be. We can't point to a date and say that's it. But we know that for now, we have a little more time. You know, there is no doubt that you and I, we are living in the last days. The kingdom of God has come because God himself has visited his people in the person of Jesus Christ. You cannot escape his kingdom. You cannot run from it. You cannot cross a border. You cannot escape it. God's judgment is coming. But there is a little time there is time for you and me. There is time to repent. There is time to believe the gospel. And there is time to repeat the call of Jesus. Repent and believe the gospel. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior.